said first trip to Brisbane, my seven-year-old was very excited because he thought there'd be different Pokemon here than there are in Auckland, <laughs> where we're living at the moment, um, and I've been instructed to come back to catch a few that he doesn't have and to, to come back, but that will take place tomorrow. Um, so, as Ian said, I'm going to talk about some of our uh, work in data to decisions by adaptive reduced models. Um, what I'm going to show you is some work that uh, draws on a variety of things but is pred predominantly the work of Benjamin Peerstorfer, uh, one of my postdocs who had planned to be here, unfortunately at the last minute couldn't make it because he just uh, is, uh, accepted a faculty position at University of Wisconsin and in the changeover of visa he uh, <coughs> was not able to, to travel and leave, leave the US. And then uh, Victor Singh who's one of my current PhD students. Uh, what I want to do today is just start off um, with some general motivation. So talk a little bit about data to decisions and engineering systems, what is the opportunity, what are the challenges. Um, I'll talk mostly about aerospace systems, but certainly my comments apply more generally to, to, other, to other systems, and I'll give you some other examples. Then I'll uh, talk a little about projection-based reduced models, give you some of the basic um, ideas of how reduced models work, and then go on to talk a little bit about adaptive data-driven reduced models and give you an idea of some of the things that we do to enable this data to decisions flow in uh, aerospace systems. Okay, so um, starting off first with just a, a few high level thoughts about the opportunity and I'm pretty sure I won't say anything here that uh, people in the room don't, don't already know but um, at least maybe giving you some perspective of, of where we're coming from. So certainly we all know that we're in the, the new era of data deluge that the digital devices are everywhere, they're interconnected, and in fact, uh, we have more data than we can really use effectively. But there's more than that. Uh, we're also in an era where the rise of computational capabilities means that we can start to do real-time real, real and in-situ decision-making. So by in-situ, I meant, might mean, for example, decision-making on board an aircraft. Um, and to make it tangible for you, just think about the computing power that you carry around. This is often used as an example in your smartphone. The fact that we can actually play a game like Pokemon Go is really pretty remarkable when you think of the, the computational power that we all have in our pockets. The same is very much true for aircraft flying around. What is possible now to do in computations in real time while the aircraft is flying completely changes the way we can think about using data to make decisions. And then there's a third piece, which, are, uh, which is the technology piece, the new technologies that are really what is driving these unprecedented, uh, unprecedented levels of, of sensing capabilities. And again, in the case of aircraft, what that means is that we can sense all kinds of things that we couldn't sense before, different kinds of data, and I'll, I'll give you some examples of that in, in just a second. Put all that together with uh, increasing demands. We just heard uh, from Troy about increasing demands on the, uh, the research enterprise. It's true for everything, for the way we conduct research, for the systems we build. We need to be more efficient, more adaptable, more reliable. And in engineering systems, uh, we're, we're seeing increasing level of autonomy. So this is really a great story, the data, the computation, the technologies, and then the increasing demands, because what it says is that there's a, a real need and a real opportunity for fundamental mathematical and computational methods that can leverage all these opportunities and really drive towards this, this, uh, this fourth bullet. And of course, all these comments apply to many, many different kinds of systems, energy systems, exploration, infrastructure, transportation, aerospace, almost anything that you can think of um, has, has, has really this, this enormous opportunity. So thinking uh, a little bit more specifically about aerospace systems, which is what I spend uh, most of my time thinking about it, um, it's great that we have all this data available, but to really move towards better prediction, better design, and ultimately better decision making, which is what we're after, it's not just about models, it's not just about data, we also need models. And one of the reasons we really need models is, as I said earlier, we, we have a lot of data, but what do you do if you have a millisecond to make a decision on an aircraft 
and you have tons and tons of sensor data. How do you make sense of it? How do you even know which data to read? It can't just be about the data. We need models to help us extract information and target the right kind of data to make our, our decisions. So that's one piece of it. We need models to provide kind of a lens through which to view all this data. The second is this, this word here, prediction. And again, data are great. They can uh, help you learn a lot about what's going on in your system. But uh, certainly for aerospace systems, and I think for many other engineering systems, to truly be predictive, we can't throw the physics out of the window. In the face of the data, we still know certain things about the system. We know about conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. Those are physical principles that are embodied by our, our, our models. So really, where the opportunity uh, lies is in bringing models and data together, using a rich class of models to interpret data and ultimately to drive decisions. Again, I, as I said, uh, we can think about models as being the structured lens through which we can interpret large data sets. Um, and models play a really important role in making this, this problem tractable, that we need to exploit uh, problem structure. We need to think about properties of the model and ultimately what decisions we want to make uh, exploit that structure to, uh, to, to get and to, to make these, these problems tractable. And when I start talking about reduced order models, what you're going to see are a lot of these sort of high-level themes distilled down to uh, something quite tangible in a mathematical framework, a way that we can start with physics-based models, incorporate data, use a combination of models and data together to drive decisions in the system, but also to exploit the structure both of the problem itself and of the decisions we're trying to make so that uh, in the end we have a problem that, that is, is tractable. Okay, so let me uh, make, make this all a little bit more tangible by uh, talking about two specific examples. The first example is uh, the idea of a self-aware aerospace vehicle. So uh, what is a self-aware aerospace vehicle? It says up here, dynamically adapts the way it performs missions by gathering information about itself and its surroundings and responding intelligently. So what do I mean by that? Uh, so in development are uh, new sensing capabilities, and in particular, a technology that I think is really exciting that's in development is the idea of a sensor skin. So today, if you looked at a, an aircraft wing, you would see discrete sensors kind of positioned along the wing. The day is coming, not too far in the future, where the aircraft wing could have a, an entire skin over it, or uh, maybe the sensing capability could even be embedded in the materials so that we could uh, receive pressure or strain or whatever measurements over the entire body of the aircraft, the entire wing, the entire fuselage. So what's the idea of a, a self-aware vehicle? You could imagine that we have a vehicle, and in my examples it will be a, an unmanned aerial vehicle, a UAV or a drone. Uh, flying around, and you can imagine that this vehicle gets damaged. Maybe it's uh, in a hostile environment, maybe it gets hit with something, maybe it's um, fighting a fire or in a, in a sort of a sandy environment and it sustains damage. So you can now imagine taking the uh, sensor information from the skin in real time, letting the vehicle figure out how it's feeling. I'm damaged, I'm damaged a lot, I'm damaged a little, or maybe it's really hot and smoky here figure out kind of what's going on about its own health and its environment, then dynamically update its flight envelope. So a flight envelope is what tells the vehicle it's allowed to do. I can fly this fast, I can pull up this quickly, I can turn this tightly, and normally that flight envelope is static. It's something that we set in the design. But now imagine that this flight envelope is updated dynamically. When the vehicle is healthy, it can fly fast and it can turn sharp corners. When the vehicle is slightly damaged, it can't quite pull as many Gs as it, as it, as it maneuvers. When it's very damaged, maybe it can only do uh, uh, very limited maneuvers. Update that dynamically, and then with a modified flight envelope, start to replan its mission and, uh, and either decide to abandon or to execute the, mi the mission in a different way. And so uh, this is one of the, the problems that we're working on. We're working on this problem with Aurora Flight Sciences, which is a, a an aerospace company who design and build UAVs. And what you can see here is a simulation of a UAV that's asked to uh, make it to a goal, the star here, in minimum time, navigating this, uh, this 3D environment with these obstacles. 
And in the simulation, the vehicle was healthy. It had zonal capability that we knew from design. And you can see that the path planner lets the vehicle take, uh, take the, the shortest route there to the, to, the, um, to the goal. So now what happens if our vehicle is flying? And just before it gets to this first corner, it gets damaged. What we're doing now is incorporating the data from the sensors. Uh, letting the vehicle update its estimate of its own health and then replan and you can see uh, that what it's done now is it's recognized that it's a little bit damaged, it's updated its flight envelope, it said I couldn't take that really tight turn around the, the corner <coughs> so I'm going to take the longer way around, uh, it takes longer to get to the goal but I can execute the mission without causing structural failure by exceeding the loads on my, on my wing. Okay, so this is, um, this is a really difficult problem to solve Path planning itself is difficult enough, but now thinking about collecting data in real time, solving an inference problem to infer vehicle health, updating the flight envelope, which means putting in the, the predictive models that tell you how a structure, the, the health of a structure relates to what a vehicle can do, and then feeding all that into a replanning algorithm. And all of that has to be done from the moment the vehicle gets damaged to the point where it has to make the decision about which corner, how sharp of a corner to take. Uh, so it's a really challenging problem and it's especially challenging because of the, the time constraints. <coughs> um, but like I said, this is a great problem because it really motivates a lot of what I was saying and it motivates the need for mathematical and computational algorithms that really exploit the structure and I'll, I'll show you how, how we can achieve this, this kind of problem. Um, how we uh, sort of tackle these, these problems at a high level. What you can see here is uh, flow from data to decisions. So prior information, the kind of information we would normally, or well, today we compute about flight limits, uh, what the vehicle is capable of in our plan, the inference through the vehicle to the vehicle state, the vehicle health, <coughs> the prediction problem, again to update the, the flight envelope, and then the planning. So there's that flow that I'm talking about all the way from data to decisions through inference, prediction, planning, and ultimately action. And again, just to emphasize the point, here's the data, but here are the models sitting underneath. And um, these models are adaptive in the sense that the models are also updated from, from the data. They're multi-fidelity in the sense that it's not just one model but it may be many different kinds of models of different fidelity. Sometimes coarse, cheap, approximate models are good enough or they're all we can afford to make a quick decision. Sometimes we need more sophisticated models and we have time to run them. And I won't talk about it today, but a lot of the work that we do in uh, my group also look at how do we draw on multiple models and figure out how to combine results from different models or decide which models to execute, execute when. So that's one example. I want to show you a second example just to uh, hopefully convince you that these ideas are really quite general and not just specific to uh, futuristic UAVs. This is another uh, problem that we've worked on, the problem of uh, real-time contaminant release response. And so the setup here is that we have some domain of interest. Does anybody recognize this? If, uh, is anybody a fan of Frank Gehry? Where's the, the jumble that is? That's, so this is the data center at, at MIT, which is the Frank Gehry building. If you ever visit MIT and you see kind of the Dr. Seuss looking building, that's kind of our, well, our, our iconic Frank Gehry. So this is the MIT campus. There's the, the big dome where the students are always doing hacks and putting police cars or R2D2 or something on, on, on top. This is Killian Court um, and the, yeah, this data center and, and MIT campus. Aero, Aero Astro sits over here in this, this corner of campus. So this is uh, MIT campus. And uh, the setup is that there's some kind of a release, accidental or uh, intentional on campus. We have these sensors distributed across the campus. And again, in real time, we want to take the data and infer uh, where the contaminant was released, but more importantly, where it's going to go so that we can make decisions on uh, how to evacuate people. Um, and this is, this is slightly older work, but I show it to, uh, to emphasize that, again, it's the same kind of flow, sense, infer, predict, and act. And again, how uh, one can solve all of this is a combination of using the data together with the physics-based models um, to drive predictions and ultimately, ultimately actions. 
Okay, so getting a little bit more to specifics, um, the way that we're going to tackle these problems is through what's called an offline-online approach. Basically, we're going to divide the computational work of the, uh, of the approach into two different pieces. Offline is where we run our expensive high-fidelity models. And when I say high-fidelity models, I'm talking things like... Uh, talking things like computational fluid dynamics models that analyze the flow over the wing of the aircraft or finite element models of the structure, where we can really do a detailed analysis and, uh, and start to study what's going on. And we embody that information by generating what are called snapshots, so solutions of the high fidelity models and building libraries. And at this stage, we also generate reduced models, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how, how that works. Then online, so now in the situation where we're collecting data and we need to make decisions, uh, we dynamically collect data from the sensors. We might have some kind of a classification of system behavior, so quickly trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, we might be selecting an appropriate library record or maybe selecting a reduced model. Then doing a rapid prediction, control, optimization, rapidly solving whatever problem it is that we have, whether it's prediction, control, optimization, or UQ, maybe adapting our reduced models, and maybe adapting our, our sensing strategies. So there's a lot we could be doing online, but what you notice is that the expensive work has been moved to this offline phase where we have time and uh, computing resources to really access our high-fidelity models. And so up here, we're focused on models, capturing the physics-based information, and down here online, we're trying to really leverage the, the synergies of the models and the data together. Okay, so that all sounds great, but now you ask, well, how, how, how can you do all this? How do, how, how do we go about actually turning this into a, an algorithm that could be running on board an aircraft? And underlying um, a lot of what we do is this idea, of, is this methodology of projection-based model reduction, which is a way to create cheap but accurate models that embody the physics. So I'm going to uh, just give you sort of a very, very basic overview of projection-based model reduction to give you an idea of, of how it works. And I'm going to uh, start off by writing my physics-based model in this form. So um, I'm writing the model as a system of ODEs. So to the high school students, you guys haven't, haven't heard of an ODE yet, have you? No, it's an ordinary differential equation. See, that sh shows us. We always put acronyms on our slides that we think are really sure. Ordinary differential equations. So these are equations where uh, the equation evolves in time. Um, they're equations that, that describe many, many physical phenomena all around us. And in many cases, um, the system of ODEs is going to come from discretization of a partial differential equation describing the system of interest. So on the left here is, um, is a system that's linear in the state, x. On the right here is a general nonlinear system. So I've got here my state x, uh, I've got inputs to the system u that might come through forcing or through boundary conditions. I've got some parameters p, and in this linear system my matrices a, b, and c can depend on the parameters. And then I've got outputs of, of interest y. So over here again, linear in state, the time evolution of x, x dot is ax plus bu. Uh, over here the general, the general uh, non-linear non system. So what's an example of uh, what all these different quantities could be? If I have a CFD model, so the model of the flow over an aircraft wing, say, then the vector x, the state vector, is the vector of unknowns that I need to solve for in my model. Um, so these are things like velocities and pressure of the flow. If I have a model that's, say, uh, a 2D incompressible Navier-Stokes model, the unknowns are x and y velocity and pressure. When I discretize the wing, discretize the, the domain, and put down my, my CFD grid, I'm actually going to end up solving for the unknowns at every point in my grid, or the unknowns corresponding to, to all my basis functions. And so what that means is that my state vector x, the unknowns, is actually a very, very big vector. It's probably got hundreds of thousands or even millions of unknowns in it. These parameters p that show up in the matrices a, b, and c, these are parameters that describe the problem. They may describe the geometry of the wing. They might describe coefficients inside the, the PDE. The external inputs U, uh, as I said, these might come through boundary conditions. So if the wing is moving, 
then the you would prescribe the motion, the bouncing around or the twisting of the, the wing, or maybe some kind of a disturbance in the flow. And in the outputs here, why? Uh, they could really be anything, but this is where the decision that I'm really trying to drive comes in. It tells me, I don't care about all of X. I don't care about the solution everywhere on the wing. What I care about are maybe integrated quantities, so like lift force, drag force, or moments. Or maybe I'm interested in seeing what's going on at the flow at a particular, particular point on the wing. So what's important about this slide is to realize that this is a really big system. It's got millions of unknowns. This matrix A is a million by a million. It's expensive to solve. But what we're generally, in, well, in, in, in many applications and in this data to decisions flow, what we're really interested in is how inputs U and parameters P translate to our outputs Y. And while X is really, really big, millions, we usually have only a few inputs and a few outputs. And so what we're going to do with model reduction is to say, can we come up with a simpler, smaller, cheaper model that still captures the relationship between the inputs and the parameters and the outputs, but doesn't have this big giant state X sitting in, in the middle of it. So can we model the input-output behavior, but with a much simpler, simpler and, and cheaper system? And the way we go about doing that uh, in a projection-based reduced model is with the idea of projection, which says, let's take our million-dimensional state X, let's represent it in a low-dimensional basis. So the VIs here are my basis vectors, um, and I'm going to have little n of them. I'm going to have these coefficients, X, R, I, the reduced state, that tells me uh, how much of each basis vector do I need in order to best approximate this state. The matrix form, X is V times X reduced. I'm also going to define uh, another basis, W. It's got the same dimensions as V, constructed in such a way that W and V are orthogonal. Then I'm going to come back to my general big large system. I substitute in X is V times X reduced. I substitute in everywhere I see X here, I write V times X reduced. Now over here, I've got still millions of equations but I have now many fewer degrees of freedom. So in general, I'm not going to be able to satisfy all the equations. I'll have a residual. This won't be zero. I'll have a non-zero residual. That's where W comes in. This is a, called a petrov galopin projection. I enforce the condition that the residual is orthogonal to the space spanned by the col columns of W. W transpose R equals zero. Then that gets me the reduced model. And what you see about the reduced model is that it takes the same inputs and parameters, U and P, it generates the reduced order outputs, the YR, which if we do things right are going to be good approximations of what we would have gotten for Y. But now you can see that instead of having a big giant X inside, it's got this little X reduced, and these matrices A reduced, B reduced, C reduced are these projections, W transpose AV, W transpose V, and CV, projections of the original big A, B, and C. Okay, so there, there are sort of a lot of um, complications about representing some of the, uh, the behavior here. But in a nutshell, this idea of taking a big system and projecting it onto a low dimensional subspace is very fundamental and it gets you to a reduced order model that uh, hopefully, if you do things well, is, is a good representation of your original system. So now you ask, how do you come up with the Vs and the Ws? And of course, there are many, many methods to do that. Uh, one that's commonly used and that we use a lot is the POD, the proper orthogonal decomposition, uh, which is essentially singular value decomposition um, going by many names and, and, and uh, very closely related methods in other fields. POD says generate snapshots, run that expensive simulation, this is in the offline phase, generate solutions of that big vector x, x1, x2, up to xk, I'm going to generate k of them. Stack all those snapshots up into a snapshot matrix, compute the SVD of the snapshot matrix and choose the POD basis vectors to be the less singular vectors of the snapshot matrix that correspond to the biggest singular values. Why is that a good choice? The classic uh, SVD or the least squares uh, result tells you that, that this is the optimal choice in the sense that it, uh, and this, this, this measure of the error, this L2 norm of the, of, of the error, 
it's the optimal choice for representing the snapshot data that you started with. Now, that doesn't mean you have the optimal reduced model, but uh, this turns out to actually be a very good choice that works for, for many problems. And again, of course, there are many more complicated ways to choose the, uh, the, the spaces on which we do the projection, but this is a simple one, and it gives you an idea of how these methods work and kind of what, what goes on. Okay, so in uh, classical model reduction, people tend to build reduced models um, once and use them in a static way. So what that means is in the <coughs> offline phase, we do what I just said. We run the high fidelity code, generate these snapshots, build the low dimensional basis, do the projection, and then say, great, here's my reduced model, go off and use it. And that might, uh, might work well, and probably does work well in, in some situations, but it really doesn't work well in many other situations. One is if the physical system is pretty complex, to think that we could go from millions of degrees of freedom down to 10 or 20 and not lose anything is uh, probably unlikely. Uh, it might be that we have other information sources besides models. So there might be uh, human opinion that we want to bring in or uh, other sources of data. It might be that the decision goal changes dynamically. What we thought we wanted to do when we started off in the offline phase actually changes might be that our physical system is changing dynamically. Think of my UAV flying around and getting damaged. If I build the reduced model for the undamaged aircraft, probably it's not gonna do a very good job of predicting once the aircraft is, is damaged. And in all of these situations, we don't wanna just be stuck with the reduced model. We actually wanna think about how we could uh, adapt and learn the models, and in particular, how we could do that online. So uh, this is where we now move to thinking about dynamic data-driven decisions via adaptive reduced models. So breaking away from just this classical build the model and then use it and thinking about how, uh, how we can use the data not just to drive the decisions but also to adapt the models which in turn will help us to drive better decisions. And so again we're going to be thinking about this whole flow of sense, infer, predict, plan and act not just as one cycles through but as something that's really continually evolving and uh, going on as our, our system executes. Okay, so data-driven reduced models. So the adaptation and learning, again, they're data-driven. And what do I mean when I say data? Um, data could be sensor data collected online. So it could be my sensor skin giving me strain measurements or pressure measurements as my aircraft is flying. But it could also be simulation <coughs> data collected online. Um, so it could be that I'm running simulations and generating data. It could be that my online phase is actually solving some kind of an optimization problem. And as I'm traversing the design space, um, I'm executing simulations and getting, learning more about which part of the design space I'm visiting and getting more information. So it could be that the data that I use to adapt my models actually comes from simulations. But what's really key is that even though we're going to use data to adapt and learn the models, our physics-based model remains as an underpinning. And the way we do that is because we build the reduced models up front from that high-fidelity system. And remember, that high-fidelity system came from the qu equations governing the system, conservation of mass, momentum, energy, and, and so forth. How do we do the adaptation? Um, you saw the, the basic flow, which was generate somehow generate the V and the W, generate the basis, then do the projection to create the reduced order matrices, the A reduced, B reduced, C reduced, and come up with a reduced model. So you could imagine that you could adapt the basis, you could adapt the V and the W, and in fact TC, who is there, who is uh, joining Monash later this year and we're giving a talk tomorrow, um, has done some really nice work showing how uh, the basis can be adapted as one collects data, in this case, and in, in, in this work here, the data was coming from solving an inverse problem. Um, I haven't talked about nonlinear systems, but it turns out there's a whole bunch of stuff you have to do with nonlinear terms. You could adapt the way that nonlinear terms are approximated, and Benjamin's looked at that. You could actually take the reduced model itself and say, I'm not going to go back to the basis. I'm just going to adapt the A reduced, the B reduced, and the C reduced. Um, and again, Benjamin's looked at that. Or you could imagine constructing lots of reduced models in the beginning and then using kind of the machine learning classification 
more approach where you say, let me figure out what's going on right now and you choose model number five or choose model number 498 and do the adaptation through a localization. So lots and lots of ways to think about doing the adaptation and we've been looking at a number of them. Of course, each one has advantages and disadvantages and depending on what kind of data, what kind of models, what kind of decisions, um, you might choose one, one over the other. So I'm going to talk about uh, just one of those. Again, just to give you an idea of how it works without going into to too many of the details. Um, so in this particular example, we have a system and we have two different kinds of parameters. We have parameters that we can observe, observable parameters, and then we have parameters that are changing but we can't observe. They're called latent parameters. And so what's an example of a latent parameter might be the damage on the wing. The wing gets damaged and I can't directly observe the damage. So the parameter is changing uh, but I don't, I don't necessarily know exactly what it is. But I'm collecting data from, from the system. So uh, again, a classical approach, if you were going to take sort of the standard reduced sort of modeling approach to this problem, uh, what would you do? You would say, grab my sensor data stream, solve some kind of an inference problem, try to figure out what the latent parameters are, get estimates, let's say, of the damage. Now I have an updated estimate of these parameters let me uh, take those parameters, build a new full order model, FOEM, so a new finite element representation of the wing, run that whole machinery of generating the basis and doing the projection, come up with a new reduced order model, and then, and then I'm, I'm good to go. And then when the parameter changes again, again another inference step, build another full model, do the projection, build another reduced model. So that's fine, and that would probably work well. Of course, the problem is that we're not going to be able to afford, if we're in a situation, let's say, on board an aircraft, we're not going to be able to afford to create a new funded element model and run it and build the, the reduced model. That was the offline phase, and it was offline because it's expensive. So instead, what we're going to try to do is initially um, start off with our nominal, nominal conditions, do our normal flow of assembling the full model, projecting, and coming up with the reduced model, and then as the sensor data stream comes in, we're instead going to try to directly adapt this reduced model so we're going to have a dynamic reduced model. But we're not going to adapt it in just any way. We're going to try to adapt it so that we actually get back to the solution that we would have gotten with enough data and, and so with some conditions on the noise, back to the reduced model that we would have gotten if we could have afforded to go back and rerun the whole thing and, and compute the new, the new re reduced model. So let me try to give you a sense of how that might work. Um, in this problem, I don't have any time dependence, so I'm just going to have a, a steady problem. So I'm going to write the system now as AX equals G. And I've broken out the parameters where now I have my mu parameter, which is the observable parameter, the thing that I know, and this latent parameter, eta, I'm going to write as a subscript because I, I don't know what it is, but my true system matrix, my A and my true state X, depend on this, this latent parameter. Um, so here's my uh, nominal reduced model. I have nominal conditions, and for my aircraft wing example, this is undamaged. I can build my finite element model. I set eta equal to eta naught, that's undamaged. I can run a whole bunch of simulations, choose different values of mu, run the simulations, collect the snapshots, build the snapshot matrix, do the SVD, get the POD basis, again for the eta naught conditions, and then build the reduced model. And here's that same reduced model we saw before. There's the V transpose AV, gives the A tilde, and the V transpose G. So this is now the small, cheap, reduced model built at conditions eta naught. Uh, again, with the uh, classical approach, what would happen if the damage change. So what if we move from eta to eta 1? The aircraft wing gets damaged. We would collect the sensor data. We would try to infer eta 1. We would get an estimate of eta 1. We would go and rebuild the A for eta 1 and then project and then build a new reduced model. But we don't have time to do that. So instead what we're going to try to do, back to this picture, is read and adapt that reduced order model directly. We want to avoid anything um, that's super expensive, so we're going to try to avoid inferring the latent parameter, and we're going to avoid recourse to the full model, avoid the expensive finite element solves. 
but we want to recover the reduced model that we would have gotten by going back. How can you do this? So here are our sensor samples. And in this particular setup, I'm actually, um, I've set it up here. We're assuming that the, the sensors are giving us a full state sample. So this is the case where I have the sensor wing and it gives me the strain or the pressure measurements everywhere. We've also looked at, you know, and, and, and this is also, I have it as, a, um, as a, an important open question, you know, how much data do you really need? Do you need the state everywhere or can you have partial measurements? If you have data everywhere, you might not have time to process it all. Um, how, do, how does the process change and how do things converge if you have approximate information or partial information in here? But for here, let's assume we have the, the data that uh, gives us a, the state solution everywhere. So we've got a few things to do. Uh, we need to adapt the POD basis. So here's the V eta naught, that's the POD basis computed at the nominal conditions. We can adapt that using um, incremental SVD. This is some really nice work from 2006 from Brand that says um, with this additional data that's coming in, I can very rapidly update the, the SVD. So I'm going to get a new basis matrix. Uh, we also are going to have to update the reduced order model. So we're going to have to update the A tilde and the G tilde. And we can think of uh, the new A tilde that we want for the new value eta as being an update, this delta A tilde, from the nominal A tilde that I started from. And the way we do it is we solve an optimization problem where we look for that update, that delta A, that minimizes uh, this error. And you can probably see that this error is is basically a residual from the updated reduced model. And what's really nice about this optimization problem is that it has a lot of structure um, and it's something that you can solve very uh, efficiently online. Um, there's, again, a lot of details that I'm kind of glossing over here. You need to think about the rank of the update. Uh, we do that adaptively to make sure that we get valid updates. And one of the reasons that everything is constructed in this way and we have this, this least square fit we can show that getting the full sensor information, if there were no noise, with this dynamic reduced model, once you've collected enough information from your sensors, you would converge to the reduced model that you would have gotten by going back and doing the full rebuild and, and project. And so that's sort of an attractive property because it tells you that you're building a dynamic reduced model um, that's, that's actually an accurate or is the correct projection of the system dynamics that are there. Of course, there are really important questions about what happens when you have noise, how noise uh, impacts what goes on, and also what happens if you have incomplete sensor data. So again, without too many of the details, there's the, the adaptivity procedure in a nutshell. Get new sensor samples, update the snapshot matrix, adapt the POD basis, that's the V, compute these low rank updates. Uh, these are the delta A's, and um, there's a similar update for the, the right-hand side. Um, all of these are done in a way that exploits low rank structure of the update, of the snapshot update, which means that they can be done online in a, in a very efficient way. We don't get the dimension of the full model out completely. We end up with a complexity that scales linearly with the dimension of the full model. It's much, much cheaper than rebuilding the reduced order model from scratch. It may be that this is still too much for you if, uh, for example, you have just milliseconds to make a decision. But this is the price you pay for getting those convergence guarantees about recovering the original reduced model. Um, at this point, I don't know any way to get this scaling out and still be able to say something about the dynamic reduced model that we use. Okay, so one uh, quick example to uh, just to, to, to show you how, how that method works. So we're just going to look at a plate. So this would be something that maybe represents a section on, on the wing. And here's the nominal conditions. Um, in this plate, there are four different regions, four different thickness regions on the plate, the different colors. And then and there's the corresponding deflection field for the undamaged case. Over here is an example where we've uh, put some damage on the plate. Uh, the damage up to up to 20%. The damage here is just represented by changing the structural properties of the plate. And here you can see the corresponding deflection field. Okay, so what are we looking at in this plot? We're looking at 
the average absolute L2 error over the test set. So we have a, a test set of some simulations and uh, we're looking at how the reduced order model performs in terms of being able to predict the deflection of the plane. And the deflection of the structure is of course important for figuring out um, ultimately what you can, can sustain in terms of, of, of the loads and, and the, the operation of the aircraft. Um, this is number of sensor samples read. So you can think of this axis as being like time, the, the data that are coming in. As time goes on, we're collecting these sensor, sensor samples. The black line here is the re rebuilt model. So this is basically, the black is the best that we could do with a reduced model. But what we're doing here is that every time there's a damage event, and you can see the damage events in these uh, discontinuities, every time the plate gets damaged, in this black line, we go back and we rebuild a finite element model and do the projection and get a new reduced model. And again, we can't, we can't do that online, but this is kind of like our best case with a reduced model as this plate keeps getting damaged. In red is the static model. It's to say, uh, if we just use the undamaged reduced model and said, let's ignore the damage and just keep going along, then as you would expect, that static model just gradually gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse until you get to the point that actually pretty quickly you start incurring some, some quite um, significant errors. Now the blue is the dynamic approach and what you see is that a damage event occurs. Immediately your reduced model is not very good because it's still the old model, but you start acquiring the sensor data and adapting and every time a new sensor sample comes in you do a rank one update and then another sensor sample comes in you do another rank one update and then what you see is you're coming down these curves until eventually you've got enough sensor data that you recover um, this, this black, black uh, point. And you can see Benjamin set it up so that as soon as he has enough sensor data, he um, <coughs> hit it with another damage event and so then it became bad again and then it comes down and then it goes up. Okay, so like I said, you know, there's a lot of um, interesting and still open questions about the effects of sensor noise and also the effect of not enough data because if the damage is occurring rapidly, you obviously don't have time to come down these curves. And you're probably going to have something more, more like this, this red curve. But what you can see is the, the data coming in and adapting the model and getting you back to good performance as, as things go on. And you know, it should be clear that um, you know, even with the, the best data and the best models in the world, if you have really severe damage events, there's not going to be a whole lot you can do. But, um, but uh, in many cases, I think we can we can really aid decision decision making. Okay, so one question: If you were, um, for example, the guys at Aurora Flight Sciences who we work with, I've mentioned they uh, design and build UAVs. They're really excited about this project because um, they actually say to me in our meetings, the sensor technology, the skins are not quite there, but they're close. They say there's so much sensor technology out there, but we don't put the sensors on board our UAVs today because the sensors cost money and they add weight, and we don't know what to do with the data right now. So the, the UAVs they're building could have more sensor capabilities, but they don't because what would they do with the data? And they would love to be able to put more sensors on board and then do things with their data to make their UAVs more powerful. Um, but so you could ask this question, particularly if you were a senior craft designer. This all seems rather complicated. It's a lot more complicated than what we do today. There's all these models and this adaptation. Is it worthwhile? I showed you our simulation that said, well, yeah, the vehicle goes around the, the long way. So uh, one of the, the things we've looked at um, is we, we ran, and this is uh, Victor, Victor Singh's recent work, ran a whole bunch of scenarios with different kinds of damage, um, different things going on with this dynamic replanning of the, of the UAV. And what you see in this chart is a comparison between a baseline strategy, which just takes the vehicle envelope and just flies with it. That's what people do today. The vehicle has a flight envelope, it has limits. It can fly, like I said, it, it's got a maximum speed, it's got a maximum, a minimum turn radius. It can only pull up so much. That's just fixed and if you get damaged, it's kind of too bad, right? Maybe you're lucky, maybe you're not. And in the various scenarios we ran, 84% of the time the UAV survived and was able to make it to the goal. But 16% uh, of the time, either th there are a few collisions. Path planning, like I said, it's a, it's a pretty challenging problem. These little X's are where the UAV hits one of those obstacles. So 
There are a few collisions in both cases, but um, a bunch of the time, close to 16% of the time, the, um, the vehicle undergoes structural failure, and that's because it was damaged, but it still flew. It took that tight turn, it exceeded its structural load, and so we call that a, a structural failure. On the other hand, with the dynamic um, decision-making capability, we didn't, uh, well, we have one sitting out here, but 99% survivability. And this is, you know, this is pretty significant, increase from 84% to 99%. You could think about that in terms of um, the costs of losing your vehicle. You could think about what it means in terms of even being able to push the envelope more and to have vehicles with more capability that can get into um, more challenging situations. So I think um, you know this is just one example, but it's one that shows that this kind of data-driven decision-making, yes, there's a lot of stuff that has to go into it, but really can have big impacts on, um, on the ultimate system, system performance. So just a few uh, thoughts to close with some conclusions and um, hopefully raise a few um, thoughts in your mind that I'm sure we'll discuss over the next two days. Certainly, um, I've talked a lot about aircraft, but I think we all know that many, if not all, engineering, engineered systems of the future will have abundant sensor data. Uh, reduced models, which is something that I've been working on for a long time, certainly I think have a, an important role to play in, in, in that. Um, you've seen that our methods really hinge on this idea of offline online decomposition. What is it that you can do ahead of time when you have time and computing resources and you can really leverage your physics-based models that are expensive? What is it that you can then put online to make the most of both data and models together? Um, adaptation is, is really important. And I don't talk um, so much about this, but this idea of really targeting the decisions that you want to make so that you're going after the right low dimensional structure is, uh, is really, really important. But again, leveraging the relative strengths of models and data. I feel like so often we forget about the, the models when we talk about big data. But there are still many, many important um, and open challenges. So one is I've, show, I've shown you a couple different uh, pieces. I've shown you the reduced order models applied to the panel level, and then I've also showed you the vehicle level <coughs> simulation. Those vehicle level simulations have got much simpler uh, structural models in them. They don't have the full vehicle funded element models in them yet. And trying to scale the reduced order modeling technology to go from panel level, even wing level, to complete vehicle is actually really, really challenging. So. Um, you know, some of the important ideas there, the idea of multi-scale models, physical behavior that happens all the way from the really detailed uh, local models of damage all the way up to the vehicle level. You can't just create a model of a vehicle that resolves damage everywhere. You have to think about the multiple scales in the model. Uh, I think decomposition and then breaking a problem apart and then putting the pieces back together is also a really important uh, thing to think about when we, we tackle these kinds of, of very complex multi-scale problems. Um, I haven't talked at all today about uncertainty, but that clearly plays a very important role, particularly as we talk about making decisions. You don't just want to make, you don't just want to issue a prediction, but you also want to have some sense of the uncertainty associated with that prediction and uh, what, the conf what your confidence level might be to, to make a decision. Uh, particularly under resource constraints. I did mention briefly that we, we think a lot about multi-fidelity methods, which are uh, thinking about ranges of models all the way from really cheap but very coarse to more expensive but with more detail. And thinking about how you put all that together, I think is a, a really important area of research. Um, complex nonlinear systems where a local linear subspace approxima approximation is insufficient. Models like POD that put linear subspaces through data sets are very powerful and work in many situations, but they don't always work. And I think maybe um, in the next couple of days, a couple of talks might touch on that, but more advanced methods that look for nonlinear embeddings. Um, there's, there is some nice work out there, but I think it's, it's an area where even more is needed. I did talk uh, about this, this uh, question of sensor placement and sensor acquisition. My Air Force program manager keeps telling us, stop worrying about sensor placement because that's not the problem. When the skin's there, you just have sensors everywhere. But then the problem becomes, which ones do you pay attention to? And particularly if you have a damaged region, what happens if you can't trust the sensors that are right in the region you're trying to infer about? You don't necessarily have time to take 
millions of readings from the whole wing. So how do you now think about dynamic sensor uh, reading, acquisition, managing? Um, I think some really interesting ideas that could be pursued there that, that probably couple in with some of the randomized algorithms that are in the, the, the communities, but lots and lots of questions around sensors, sensor noise, and so on. I talked about leveraging multiple sources of, of data. Um, we have another Air Force project going in on, on, on this one and, uh, and many, many more. So with that, um, let me stop. I just want to acknowledge the funding um, from my Air Force program on data, dynamic data-driven application systems, DGAS, uh, Frederica Diarimans program, and uh, the Diamond Data Models and Decisions multifaceted uh, center that, that Ian mentioned and uh, all of our papers are available. I have a great website, easy to remember, kiwi.mit.edu. So with that, uh, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take some questions. Thanks, Karen.